Mason Garvey wanted Tina Bertram dead. Mason Garvey is a respected psychiatrist. His only goal was to help Tina Bertram through her mental difficulties. Mason and I started having an affair. It was one of those May-December romances, only we're both adults. We had nothing more than a doctor-patient relationship. Fearful that Tina Bertram would make their affair public, the defendant attempted to murder Tina Bertram himself. Someone did try to kill Tina Bertram, but it could not have been Mason Garvey. He was home. Asleep. I got 338 calibers here on the wall. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must decide whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty on two separate charges attempted murder in the second degree and criminal possession of a weapon in the fourth degree. In both cases, you must be unanimous in your verdict. Guilty, guilty, not guilty, guilty. Perfect. Five guilty, seven not. Same as the first time. And the second. What are we going to do to get some traction around here? Five of you need to start listening. Seven of you need to shut up. Well, here's an idea. Let's review all the testimony again. We did that this morning. We did that before lunch. So we do it again. You do it again. Sit down. You sit down. Come on, come on, huh? Sit down, breathe, breathe. Hey, who's the foreman here? You are? So I'll tell people to breathe, okay? Look, this is not that tough a case. We just gotta plow through. I'm with downtown Skinny over here. You'll pardon me, darling. Downtown's accurate, and Skinny I love. But at Darling, I draw the line. Okay, the prosecution <clears throat> says that this shrink, Mason Garvey, was intent on killing his patient, Tina Bertram. Because Dr. Garvey was having an affair with her. Or so she says. Bertram was gonna expose Garvey for the unprofessional putz that he is. The defense contends Bertram is too loony to be believed. She makes things up. She didn't make the bullets up. There are three bullet holes in her bedroom wall. We all agree the gun was fired. Who shot the gun? That's the question. Was it Garvey or someone else? I'd like to go over the Winslow testimony one more time. For God's sake, why? He was one of the DA's key witnesses. I was committed to a psychiatric hospital when I was about 15, and I had to stay for eight years. I don't believe a word that nut job said. Hey, listen, sweetie, Winslow might be a nut, but he's no liar. And why were you first admitted to Walton Pines? Um... I had a dog problem. Why would the DA bring up the story about the dog? It made his witness look bad. I thought that was shrewd. The prosecutor was showing us that the guy was violent inside, and that's why Garvey thought Winslow would do his killing for him. There was this Pomeranian that lived next door, and it was, like, always yipping. I mean, like, all night, you know? And so I got rid of it. And how did you do that? I buried the dog up to its neck, and then I ran it over with a lawnmower. But, but that was a wrong thing to do. I still can't get over that. Pomeranians is such a beautiful breed. Killing any dog is abominable. I have two Shih Tzus at home. I think we're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> barking. Shih Tzus. Get it? Jeez. 
Just trying to keep things light. Winslow is violent, but not delusional. Huh? It's the difference between knowing you're whacked out and not knowing. He knows. Carvey is Winslow's psychiatrist. He knows he's a powder keg. So why put a gun in the man's hands? Unless Garvey means to have Winslow kill Tina Bertram. No, the gun is therapy. Did Dr. Garvey explain to you why he wanted you to shoot targets at the rifle range? So I could pretend that the targets were the people that I hated? Did you feel more in control of your anger after you left the shooting range? Yeah. Firing the gun was good. Garvey's helping Winslow work out his aggression. I still say Garvey hands a loaded weapon to a violent, unstable person who was also in love with Tina Bertram. I knew Tina from Walden Pines. We had group therapy together. Which psychiatrist ran that group? Dr. Garvey. Did you have romantic feelings for Tina? Sure, all the guys did. She was the only one worth looking at. Did you ever tell the defendant about your feelings for Tina? Yes, he told me he'd seen Tina. She was laughing about how I was a big, greasy virgin that was going to spend the rest of his life a, a big, greasy virgin. What happened then? Dr. Garvey asked me if I felt like killing her. He offered to get me a gun and the key to her house. So Garvey tries to get Psycho Boy to pull the trigger. And what did you say to that? I said no. I mean, killing a dog is one thing. Badger Monk is not making this up. No one could. Truth is stranger than fiction, and Tim Winslow is stranger than truth. He's got reasons to lie, to make the doctor look guilty. Winslow loves Tina, Garvey is his rival. He didn't know they were rivals until much later. Mr. Winslow, what was your reaction when you learned about Dr. Garvey's alleged sexual relationship with Miss Bertram? I got mad at Dr. Garvey, that he was getting her, having sex. When a man has strong feelings for a woman, it's powerful, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Is that when you went to the police about the gun range? Objection. Your Honor, I'm simply trying to establish the extent of Mr. Winslow's feelings for Miss Bertram. I'll allow it. You went to the police only after you heard about the alleged affair. Yes. Because you were jealous. Objection. Sustained. A little too far off the green, counselor. If he has reasons to lie, then Winslow might also have reasons to attack Bertram himself. Yeah. Then he blames the doctor, makes up the story about the gun range. He's crazy like a fox. Winslow is trying to frame Garvey. Should we vote? Oh, talk about your exercise in futility. I'm crazy. I've received a note from the jury telling me that after four ballads, they are unable to reach a verdict. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to suggest that you go home, have a beverage of your choice, have a hot meal, uh, take a bubble bath. I actually, I'm very partial to bubble baths myself. I can see that uh, you're not amused by that. I normally get a big laugh on the bubble bath line, so I can tell that this is a very, very tense jury. Do what I say, go home, enjoy yourself tonight, take it easy, relax, and I will see you tomorrow, and I'm certain that you're gonna be able to reach common ground. We should have bet on this one. It's still ain't too late. Hey, John. Your jury still out? Yeah. Yeah, how's your therapy going? Man, what? You see a shrink, right? Why would I need to see a shrink? You don't have one? No. 
You think I should see a shrink? Are you looking for one? Am I looking for one? No. Yeah, me neither. I'm gonna take the stairs. Tim, don't hate me, Dr. Garvey. I, I didn't want to come to court. I didn't want to testify. The cops and that prosecutor, they made me. I know. You know. Yeah, I understand. You do? Yeah. So you're not mad? No. I'm proud of you. Proud of me? You got up in that courtroom and talked in front of a whole bunch of strangers. Two years ago, you couldn't have done that. I know. Thank you. How's Dr. Freeman? Not half as good as you. <laughs> Give him time. He's a wonderful therapist, the best. I, I wouldn't recommend anything but the best for you. I'm gonna go find a, a chocolate bar somewhere. discussing Winslow anymore. You either believe his testimony or he's a lying knucklehead. Or he's a diabolical genius. Don't start, lady. Last night, I dreamed of running a lawnmower over my dog. I don't even have a dog. I dreamed I was in a hot tub in Costa Rica, but it was in the middle of a restaurant and I couldn't get the waiter's attention. All right, enough with the dreams, okay? Let's stay focused. I want to know why the cops never found the gun that was used to shoot at Tina Bertram. Because Garvey was smart enough to get rid of it. You don't, you don't keep it laying around. You dump the piece in the river. You know, he's got a munitions cache in his office. He's got more arms than the Afghanis. It's a collection. It's his hobby. None of those weapons match ballistics. You've examined Dr. Garvey's gun collection. I have. Does the ballistics comparison assert that a gun of Dr. Garvey's was used in the attempted murder? No, it does not. They may not have found the gun used in the assault, but they did find an illegal weapon. Yeah, and let's not forget, we have to decide on the gun charge. Uh, criminal possession of a weapon in a fourth degree. Did you have an unlicensed weapon in your possession? I wasn't aware that I did, no. No, you didn't have an unlicensed weapon. No, I wasn't aware that I did. Did you have possession of an unlicensed gun, yes or no? Yes. You are aware that it's illegal to have an unlicensed gun. Yes or no? Yes. Can you explain why you have an unlicensed weapon? I went to a gun show, I guess, uh, three years ago. I, I made a trade with someone. He promised to send the papers, but he never did. And I just never got around to tracking him down. Have you ever taken it outside of your home? No, I've never even fired it. I just like the look. The engraved gold-plated Walter PPK is a beautiful thing. I didn't think of it as a weapon, more as a work of art. I found his explanation absolutely plausible. He still violated the law. No, he's guilty on the gun charge. I forgot is not an excuse. I really think it's forgivable. We're not here to forgive people. We're here to figure out whether they broke the law or not. Forget about the patty cake gun charge. I mean, it's the attempted murder. That's what's important for us to decide. You know what was bothering me during my bubble bath? There was no sign of forced entry at the victim's house. Bertram says she gave Garvey a key. Did you give the defendant a copy of your house key? Yes, I did. In case he wanted to come over, you know, in the middle of the night. Uh, who else has a key? The housekeeper and the handyman. No one else? No. Just Dr. Garvey. 
There were other keys out there. It could have been the handyman who attacked her. If the handyman was the perp, he'd be the one on trial. How would we know that? <laughs> we have to assume the police interviewed the handyman and the housekeeper. The cops put all their chips in Garvey's pot. Bertram said Garvey had the key. He said he didn't. She never gave me a key. I never had a key. And yet Miss Bertram has testified that she did. Tina is a warm, vulnerable person. Unfortunately, she does have trouble discerning fantasy from reality. To me, him saying she can't tell fantasy from reality is like a 50-gallon drum of banana oil. He's just trying to set himself up as a kind, caring doctor. Oh, contraire! Dr. Garvey reminds me of my own analyst, whose care and warmth are genuine. Your analyst is not on trial. There's another quack on trial, okay? I don't like your tone. My tone? It disturbs me. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Megan, you see a psychiatrist, right? No. Well, yeah, I did uh, for a couple of years. But you don't anymore? Mm -mm. I know I was in trouble when my shrink told me that my life was like a Chinese fan opening up. That's poetic. Mm, exactly. Why, are you, are you looking for a sympathetic ear? No, no, I'm cool. I was just uh, curious. But so you figure a lot of people in the building here are getting this kind of help? Are you kidding me? Half the city's in therapy and the other half ought to be. People versus Daniel uh, O'Shea. I'm up. See you. Bye. Can we talk about the footprint? Sure, why not? It's been at least 12 hours since we covered that. Will you please tell the court what you found on the stairs leading to Tina Bertram's bedroom? Multiple footprints. And the city dust blows around. You get a layer of soot on everything. And that night there was a light drizzle. Not enough to wash away the soot, just enough to make it moist and sticky. Conditions like that, the soot adheres beautifully to a shoe. It's a Merrill walking shoe, size 10. Are you certain of that? Yeah. A Merrill walking shoe has a very distinct sole. Your Honor, I'd like to refer to the previously entered People's Exhibit 8, the shoes found in the defendant's home. Proceed, Counselor. Officer Harvey, you've examined these shoes, is that correct? I have. And could you tell the court what these shoes are? Size 10 Merrells. The same as the shoe that left the footprints on Tina Bertram's stairs. It's an exact match. If the shoe fits... Brilliant. The shoe doesn't necessarily belong to Garvey. Mr. LaPook, as a shoe impressions expert, would you say that the Merrill shoe is a popular brand? A uh, yes. And the man size 10 is a popular size, is it not? Sizes eight and a half to ten and a half account for almost 75% of men's shoes sold in this country. So it's true that there could be a lot of men walking around this city in size 10 Merrells. Yes. There was no soot on Garvey's shoes when the police found him. He could have wiped them clean. I mean, didn't I say this yesterday? Or am I having a stroke? On my way home last night, I stopped by the shoe store. I asked the clerk about those shoes. He said a lot of people buy them. I tried them on. I bought a pair, a nice walking shoe, size 10. Okay, it's 5.30. Uh, should we vote? Hey, this time, what say is show of hands, huh? No, no, no. We vote the way we've been voting. And I'm just trying to move things along. Well, maybe a show of hands to see how many people want to vote by a show of hands. Or brilliance. All in favor of voting with a show of hands, raise your hands. Seven. Yes. That means five no. You people, you're killing me. I've received a delightful note from the uh, jury. They're deadlocked, and they say they may never reach a verdict. I move for a mistrial, Your Honor. Your Honor, I think an Allen charge is in order. I really don't think lecturing this jury about time, money, and effort is going to motivate them. No, I agree. Good. I wouldn't get excited just yet. I'll forgo the Allen charge for the time being, but I'm not about to declare a mistrial. It's only two days in deliberation. I think we can turn this around. I don't think we can first three hours arguing about the same thing over and over again. I'm tired of that, right? I'm like, this the last one. Order! We're talking about the same things over and over. I said order. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that I'm using that phrase literally, you may not like what I have to say, but I want to see you back here tomorrow and give it another try. Your Honor, I think we're going to need more than a bubble bath here. Okay, well, I suggest that you each rent a uh, Marx Brothers movie and have yourself a good laugh. The Marx Brothers? I happen to be partial to um, a duck soup, but they're actually all very funny. With all due respect, it's going to be a waste of time. All due respect, tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. <laughs> I'm telling you, the scene where Groucho and Harpo and all of them get shoved into the stateroom, I laugh every time. I don't get Harpo. I never got Zeppo. Okay, can I have everyone's attention? Yesterday we talked about the gun, the keys, the shoes. What we keep skipping around is what you might call the human element. The motive. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think we should discuss motive more fully. Garvey is having an affair with a patient. He's afraid that she'll expose him and end his psychiatric career. Do we at least all agree on that? No. There's no real proof there was an affair. Once again, it's her word against his. Ms. Bertram, how long have you been in the care of Dr. Garvey? About three years. You met at Walden Pines Psychiatric Hospital? Yes. And can you describe the nature of your therapy? We were doing a thing called reparenting. Reparenting? It's role-playing, where he plays the part of my parents. That reparenting right there proves that the shrink's a sicko. Reparenting is an accepted regression therapy strategy. Accepted by who? You've done it? No. But I don't mind saying that I have worked some things out through role-playing with my analyst, and I am healthier for it. What role do you play? Swedish milkmaid? <laughs> yeah, you should give some thought to therapy. It can really benefit people with uh, retarded social skills. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody got served. Come on. Let's look at the testimony here, huh? Garvey used Bertram's vulnerability to manipulate her into having an affair. In a session with the defendant, did he ever ask you to dress a certain way? Yes. In what way was that? In a plaid skirt with penny loafers and knee socks and a crisp white blouse. Like a fantasy schoolgirl. Objection. You're right. And the schoolgirl uniform was for her benefit? Making her dress up like that is fishy. Or it's detailed therapy work. Did you ever have sex with the defendant? Yes. Well... We sort of had sex. How do you sort of have sex? He couldn't keep it going. <laughs> and then what? I'd try something else, but he couldn't keep that going either. <laughs> so usually I would just leave. And this happened at every session? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You know, this kind of stuff never happens in the beverage industry. <laughs> <laughs> or it never happened at all, according to Garvey's secretary. We talked about her the first day. Maybe you forgot. I still say if there's any hanky-panky between Garvey and Tina, the secretary knows. Mrs. Escovita, you've been Dr. Garvey's secretary how long? Eleven years. Did you ever witness any situation, any conversation, a look, a word, anything which would cause you to think there was something sexual going on between the doctor and Miss Bertram? Never. She was just one of his patients, that's all. What's she gonna say? She's gotta be loyal. My secretary would do the same thing. It's the code. What code? The secretarial code. The prosecutor blew her up, but good. Miss Bertram's appointments were always scheduled for 5.30. Isn't that right? Not always, no. I'm looking in the doctor's appointment book here. Tina Bertram, April 17th, 5.30. April 19th, 5.30. April 21st, 5.30. By April, yes. Her appointments were scheduled around that time. Before April, no. And her appointments are always scheduled for at least an hour. Is that correct? Dr. Garvey's sessions with his patients last at least an hour. Mrs. Escobedo, what time do you leave the office? By maybe 4, 5.45, 6 o'clock. So you'd leave before Tina Bertram's hour was up? Yes, sometimes. She was out of the office when Garvey was with Bertram. 
How could she possibly know what's going on? She just know. Secretaries know their bosses. She knows Garvey better than Garvey knows himself. Three days a week for a year and a half. Bertram must have wanted it as bad as him. Hey, she loved Garvey. And for that, she suffered. <laughs> Did you ever express a desire to see the defendant outside the office? Yes. I wanted the whole world to know about us. I'd fallen in love for the first time in my life. Finally, fully and deeply in love. I wanted to take our relationship to the next level. You know, go to the movies, hold hands, stuff like that. But he said no. Not in public. He didn't want us to be seen together. Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. But Ms. Bertram, just give us the uh, substance of the conversation from an overview. I'm not sure I know how to do that. Well, see, there's no way to validate what, in fact, he did say or didn't say. So just give us uh, the gist of the conversation. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. I decided to find a different psychiatrist. That way he wouldn't be compromised and we could go out on dates. Did he respond? He was adamant that I not leave. But if I learned anything from my therapy, it's how to assert myself. So I stopped seeing him altogether. Personally and professionally? Yes. And how did Dr. Garvey react? He called a lot. I told him not to call until he was ready to be a real boyfriend. I told him my new psychiatrist was hot looking, and then I hung up on him. Objection. Come on. Oops. Ugh. I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> He's afraid she's going to air their dirty linen to another shrink. He's also jealous. That's two motives for wanting to kill her. And we got motive Rama. Garvey's having sex with her, or... Whatever you want to call what they were doing. This gets out. He's hosed. He's got to shut her up. He's green with envy, so bang, bang. We don't even know for sure if Garvey was in Bertram's bedroom. Miss Bertram, did you actually see Mason Garvey in your bedroom that night? No. All I saw was a shadowy figure. She can't swear it was him. If she was lying, she would say it was him, wouldn't she? She knows Garvey's shape. She didn't even recognize his shape. A shadowy figure. Woman's got a fervid imagination. Mm. That whole thing with Russell Crowe. Miss Bertram, why did you have yourself committed to Walden Pines? Because of Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe? I fell into a deep depression after our breakup. Right there, you have to negate her entire testimony. Yeah, I mean, how do we get past her thinking she's doing the mastering commander? So you believe that you were having sex with Russell Crowe? Yes, but that wasn't real. Bertram admits to having relationships that aren't real. How do you trust anything she says about her and Garvey? Because Bertram also testified that she reached the point where she knows the difference between fantasy and reality. That sort of mental disorientation doesn't just get magically cured like hiccups. How do you know? I just know. Bottom line, Bertram is giving honest answers. I believe her. I did too. Until the defense guy started asking about her other boyfriends. So you had a sexual relationship with Dr. Garvey, but not Russell Crowe. Right. How about Denzel Washington? That wasn't real. How about Keanu Reeves? Keanu... wasn't real. She lives in fantasy land. For all we know, Bertram shot the gun herself. What? You're suggesting that she shot at herself? That, that's absurd. Not at herself. Into the wall. She got the gun shot at the wall, and made up the whole brouhaha about Garvey. For what reason? I don't know. For revenge or hysteria. There was nothing good on TV that night. Of all the asinine ideas that I've heard over the last three days, that takes the cake. Prove me wrong. Yeah, go on. No. Somebody prove me wrong. Anybody want to change their vote? My friends, I think we have a mistrial. A mistrial? 
Yeah. No. Jury doesn't decide if there's a mistrial. I decide if there's a mistrial. Go get them, bring them in the courtroom. I'm going to take them through the Allen charge. Do you know what started this television? Ever since the OJ case, and you have Martha Stewart and Tycho, now John Q. Public thinks they know more about the law than we do. I am going to get a verdict from these people if I have to nail their feet to the jury room floor. Can I get my robe, please? This trial has been expensive in time, effort, money, and emotional strain. If you fail to agree upon a verdict, the case will be left open and may have to be tried again. That is the Allen charge. Now, folks, I'm going to ask you to come back tomorrow and continue deliberations. Oh, you know what's weird? There's a long list. So, um, <clears throat> O'Brien asked me, have I ever seen a shrink? Uh -huh. Well, what's up with that? So, Brian asked you if you were seeing a shrink? Uh-huh, during arraignments. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, do I look like I need a shrink? Some days. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what, do you see one? Mm-hmm. I've been seeing my therapist for about seven years now. Seven years? Yeah. Well, that's obviously working. Have you still seen him after seven years? Yeah, it's working. Okay, it's like going to get my hair done. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. Hey. You know what? If you ask me, um, it's old Brian who's starting to crack. Mm-hmm. This trial. We would have to do this all over again. Not the worst that could happen. Look, if we have to go at this again, the prosecution has shown his case. Brian Gusso has shut his waddle already. How can I afford to go again? I've already had to put my house up as collateral to make bail. My license has been suspended. My savings are gone. I'm already buying toilet paper on my credit card. All because of that liar, that lying little bitch. Look, you know she's lying. More importantly, some of the jurors do too. That's why they're stuck. And as long as they stay stuck, we're sitting pretty. I tried everything I could to help that girl. Well, oddly enough, her lying is helping you. I must have a drink on me. We all here? Big guy's in the bathroom. I wouldn't go in there for about five minutes. That little fan is no match for me. Oversharing foul. <laughs> Today's the day, people. I got places to be. Whatever you gotta be, I gotta be worse, okay? All right, here's the thing. We got a crazy doctor, two crazy patients. It's like three cuckoo clocks. Two says it's 7.30, one says it's 5 to 10. One thing still bugs me. How is it possible that Dr. Garvey could shoot four times and miss? That's the prosecution's weakest point. Dr. Garvey's an expert shot. Mr. Merker, you're the owner of the Kipps Bay Gun Club? 22 years. Our motto is ready, aim, Enjoy. And Mason Garvey has been a member for how long? As long as I've been there, 22 years. Would you say that Dr. Garvey's a pretty good shot? He can shoot the wings off a tsetse fly at 30 yards. The defense establishes Garvey's skill in marksmanship. If he wants to shoot her, he shoots her. He doesn't miss. I thought the DA poked a pretty big hole in that one. Dr. Garvey, do you think that there's a difference between aiming a gun at a, at a stationary target, let's say at a gun range, and aiming at a live human being? Objection. Speculation. Sustained. As both a marksman and a psychiatrist, do you think that somebody shooting at a live human being might have an anxiety attack? Objection. Sustained. If you had to fire a gun at a live human being, would you be nervous? Objection. Sustained. I can understand Garvey missing with the first shot. He's nervous, right? Killing someone, got to be difficult. But he shoots three more times. That takes resolve. Leaving us with the question, if he's such a marksman, why does he miss the other three times? And you figured this out, Sherlock. Yeah. He was blinded temporarily by the muzzle flash. The what? The flash of gunpowder when a weapon is fired. After the first shot, Tina Bertram testified that she screamed and rolled onto the floor. 
But because of the muzzle flash, Garvey doesn't know she rolled onto the floor, so he shoots three more times. So you're saying a marksman like Garvey could have tried to kill her and failed? Yeah. He was there. He was blinded. And he doesn't check to see if she's dead? Maybe he heard someone coming. He hears something, he runs. You're guessing that he runs. Guessing is not fact. And therefore, I say poo. Poo? Poo. The other piece of the puzzle is the sex therapist. That sex therapist confirmed the reasons why an expert marksman like Garvey could miss. Dr. Zebula, you're familiar with the facts of this case. Yes. Hi, uh, hypothetically, explain to the jury how, how a psychiatrist might walk into a room with the intent to kill somebody and then find himself unable to do so. There's a transference going on here. The patient is imbuing the doctor with a childhood association. But there is, possibly, a counter-transference as well. That is, the doctor's reaction to the patient. I I'm sorry, can you define counter-transference? If a patient has an emotional reaction in a role-playing exercise, then it stands to reason that the doctor has one as well. If a doctor is unable to function sexually, he might eroticize his power in his professional life. Could you put that in simpler terms? <laughs> if he can't go the distance to have sex with her, he can't go the distance to kill her. If we let Garvey go, he's just going to have another chance to do some more damage to some other poor schlub. If he's guilty. Even if he's not, his methods are bizarre. And for all his marksmanship, Garvey never shot at a real live person. Maybe he loses his eagle eye. Maybe he couldn't see her in the dark. No, there was enough light in the room for him to see her to shoot her. Crime scene expert verified that. Bertram tells Garvey she's switching shrinks. Garvey has got to figure that the sex stuff between them is going to come out. He'll be ruined, so he knows he's got to do something, and he's got to do it quickly. Still, the defense attorney established out those shoes could have belonged to anyone. You know, there really is something to this whole counter-transference thing. In my analysis... Let's take another vote. The defendant owns guns, including an unlicensed Walther PPK. He had access to Tina Bertram's home, and he was there that night. After expending time, money, and effort, what has the prosecution proved? That someone wearing a popular shoe and a popular size shot three holes in Tina Bertram's wall. He's having an affair with a patient. He fears for his career. We have no fingerprints. We have no gun. We have no eyewitness. What we do have is the testimony of the prosecutor's two mentally unstable witnesses. Will the defendant please rise? In the matter of the people of the state of New York versus Mason Garvey on the count of attempted murder in the second degree, how do you find the defendant? We remain hopelessly deadlocked. On the count of criminal possession of a weapon in the fourth degree, how do you find the defendant? We find the defendant guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, the court thanks you for your diligent efforts in the deliberation of this case. You are free to go. Sentencing on the weapons count will be scheduled four weeks from today. On the count of attempted murder in the second degree, the court declares a mistrial. Uh, Mr. Ranguso, I assume that you would like to set a date for the retrial? Yes, Your Honor, at the court's earliest convenience. A hung jury. If he asked me it's the jury, we should hang. Hang this. Why does it have to be 12 jurors? 
Why couldn't it be seven? At least seven is a lucky number, not 12. There's 12 apostles. There's 12 uh, months in the year. There's 12 uh, different tones in the chromatic scale. Dixon, it was a rhetorical question. Mm. Treat yourself well. We'll talk. I hate mistrials. It's so disconcerting. You know your guy did the deed. I only know what the jury decides. You know he's gonna dance away with probation on the gun violation, too. If I do my job. You get him off, he's back in the saddle, abusing his future patients. <laughs> nah, he's finished. No practice again. With all the bad publicity he's got, who's giving him any business? Plenty of screwballs. The man's life has been ruined. Where's the mercy in the job? Well, I have none. I am going to bring back the attempted murder charge. You know that, right? It's up to you. Unless you know something I don't. Or you find a witness or the gun in six months a year, we're going to be standing here having the exact same conversation. Got to go. So, heard about the mistrial. Break, buddy. You know, <clears throat> I came up short today as well. I lost that Maluski case. I don't know if that's any consolation. It's not. You know, you, you know why I lost? The jury didn't like me. Now one of them liked me. You a little paranoid? Am I? Maybe this time I get a shrink. Maybe it's time you go home. Hey, Johnny. Is there anything I can do for you? We'll see how the night goes. Well, we can just talk if you want, like last time. Like last time what? Leave it alone, all right? Do you two know each other? On a semi-monthly basis. Let's set them up, barkeep. I'm Keenan. I'm Carol. I'm gone. Where are you going? I come here to get away from stupid judges and moronic defense attorneys, imbecilic juries, and you. I don't know how you found this place, don't really want to know, but now that you have, you've ruined it for me, thank you. He's no fun. <laughs> but he is. He can be a lot of mischief. Mischief? Ranguso? The psyche of a DA is a very mysterious thing. Yes, it is. And you, you learned this from Ranguso? Yes. All right. I want stories, all right? And if you got any pictures of my pal and his mischief, name your price. Oh, yeah, I got pictures. Oh, this is good. This is very, very good. 